first question, I, I guess I just want to ask the panelists, is there something that you saw in the, uh, the conversations going on Slack that, that you'd like to talk about? And I see Ab Abishai has a hand up. So please. I, I can't, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Several people asked about the origin of the critical mass that is a transition between the cold mode and the hot mode accretion. Uh, it is pretty straightforward. It's really a dynamical time versus cooling time. Dynamical time comes from cosmology and uh, some physics of, of the real shock uh, to compute the compression behind the shock. But the cooling time depends on metallicity. And that's a real unknown. Uh, what do we know about the actual metallicity out there near the real radius, especially at high redshift? So one makes certain estimates from observations, very crude, and get this estimate that uh, Dushan talked about of a few times, maybe seven times 10 to the 11. But there's a big uncertainty, maybe a whole dex of uncertainty. So don't take it as, as a specific you know, seven times over 11, it can be three times, it can be 10 times 10 to the 11, et cetera. It's really a big, and it depends on fluctuations in metallicity, as well as fluctuation in the accretion rate into the halo. But there's a simple, simple way to understand it. And actually Mark commented also about some other way to estimate it from entropy. But again, it has to do with assuming something about metallicity. So I think that's answered this, this question. Okay. And I guess, interestingly, um, I, I, one of the interesting results I, I find is uh, it is remarkably independent of mass over time. <laughs> Which is something, yeah. Well, this come out if you assume some metallicity dependence in time. Naturally, metallicity at the radius is lower at higher redshift. And we had to make some assumption based on some very preliminary observations that were existing 15 years ago. And from this, we got it to be pretty constant. Uh, maybe somebody knows about better estimates as a function of time of metallicity at the real radius. This can improve the estimates and maybe reduce the scatter. Okay. Um, Filippo has hand up. Yes, thank you, Dusan, for your talk. I, I see that there is some discussion about angular momentum, and I, I, I like to make a couple of points also uh, related to what you said. I think the first thing that uh, that I'd like to say is that um, uh, I don't know, maybe it's an impression that I got from uh, from uh, what you were saying, Dusan. But I, I want to point out that uh, accretion from uh, from the hot gas accretion from the corona can, and, and, uh, and under uh, uh, very simple uh, normal circumstances, make the, the disk uh, grow inside out. So it's not a problem from that point of view. And, and I actually put the paper just now in the Slack uh, uh, by Gabriele Pezzulli, myself, and, and James Binney, where you, you can see that those are even cosmologically motivated corona. Uh, it's a very, it's a very nice word. Please, please look at that paper. It's cosmologically motivated corona, so with the, the angular momentum distribution that you expect, etc. And they, they can make the disks go inside out. And you can see that the amount of gas that you get, uh, it, that uh, sorry, the amount of angular momentum is is larger than the the average angular momentum that the disk has at a certain time. So, so that is the only thing. The only thing you need from accretion from the corona is not to cool the corona in the very center. That would be a problem. But if you cool the corona over the disk, then it depends on the distribution of angular momentum, density, etc. So that that was the first point. Um, the second thing is that uh, is that um, um, I, I I was going to 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 propose you a project. Maybe we can do it together. You make uh, you make uh, data cubes, uh, H1 data cubes out of your uh, the the disks that you were showing at the end, and then and then we can see uh, if if we can detect 
these radial motions? Because I think that detecting the radial motions you were asking uh, uh, from the observational point of view, there isn't much. I got very motivated in this conference and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of trying to, to, to work on this seriously and trying to, to, to look at the sample of nearby galaxies, but we can, also, we can also do it in your simulation. And that's very important, I think. Okay, and Dushan has a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to respond briefly to Filippo. Yeah, I, I mean, I cannot like discard or anything the, the funding flows and uh, accretion of the gas and maybe moving out. Uh, I guess my point was that you can explain star formation and the radial flows without need for, for extra funding, but I mean, uh, we didn't exclude it in any way because we might not be able to resolve those kind of small scale stuff. And uh, uh, my student UCSD Cameron Trapp, who uh, will probably post a video on this in the next few days, uh, is thinking about doing something that you just suggested like seeing observationally, uh, if we can get them, uh, once we get there, we'll probably get in touch with you and uh, see what we can get out. Uh, Abishai? Continuing with the angular momentum issue, which I think is a major issue for galaxy formation, uh, I want to take you back to the high redshift cold streams that build uh, the galaxies and bring in the angular momentum. So somebody asked in the Slack whether the angular momentum is growing or decreasing in time as the stream penetrates to the galaxy. The answer is that it starts with high angular momentum because of tidal torques outside the halo, and it's losing the angular momentum as it moves in. And that's how it spars in and eventually end up in the outer disk. But I want to challenge the picture that Dushan he didn't have much time to talk about it, he talked about co-rotation, but I want to argue that, and Lucia knows this very well, it's much more complicated because, for example, typically, and I write if you have a few streams, maybe three streams, typically one of them is already co-rotating when it ends up the real radius. So when this stream is coinciding with the other streams which are co-rotating, uh, there's a loss of angular momentum. And in fact, you can end up with a compaction event, which is something you get when you lose angular momentum. Or when you merge, you can lose angular momentum and get to a bulge instead of a very nice floating disk or ring. On the other hand, if you really have your three streams co-rotating, they end up with a nice external ring and maybe uh, that you actually observe star forming green instead of just a central star formation in the middle. And one can show that the stability of such rings is when you have a big bulge also and so on. So it, it's a very complicated picture and it's very key to understand when you lose angular momentum, when you keep your initial angular momentum, because the galaxy at the end, we look very different if one or the other happens with angular momentum. So the angular momentum with cold streams is very crucial. And Unfortunately, our all of the simulations don't resolve these streams yet. So we need to do things like what Neil Mandelka described yesterday, a toy model of a simulation in a, in, a, in a cylinder. But what you really need is a cosmological simulation with much higher resolution forced in these cold streams as they go through the hot CGM and to really uh, resolve what happens to, to the angular moment in them. This would be a key to understand how to affect the galaxy. I, I see some hands up, but I, I actually want to hear uh, Frika's perspective on this because I can imagine that magnetic fields um, could have uh, quite an influence in, mag in, in angular momentum transfer in the CGM. And I'm wondering if, if I'm right about that. <laughs> so Frika. Uh, what, what you are, you but I think it's early days in, okay, so there's, I mean, so in the simulations that I've done, uh, we end up with, I'm sorry, I didn't specifically um, look at the angular momentum evolution, but we did end up with uh, very different outflows and inflows, which also um, incidentally were slower than they are without magnetic fields. 
uh, and they're they're much less mixed, so that also will affect the angular momentum distribution um, as yeah, you know things just um, sort of stay more segregated. Um, but so we end up with larger disks. But I also had a discussion with Marcus based on yesterday's uh, well uh, meeting. Uh, so he finds smaller disks with magnetic fields in an idealized cluster setting. Uh, so I think. Uh, I think we haven't said the last word about like how magnetic fields affect the angular momentum distribution and maybe that it's different um, because of different implementations or the, or the cosmological background, but it's also possible that there's just a different uh, behavior at different masses and I really only explored the Milky Way scale um, in this work. So I think there's a lot more work to be done, uh, not just on cosmic rays, which are also interesting, but also on magnetic fields. Okay, thank you. Um, Gwen. Sure. So following up what Avishai was just talking about, um, I think if people are interested in in understanding sort of how realistic this picture is of high redshift about angular momentum and, and filamentary accretion, it might be worth actually taking a more detailed look at, um, you know, near red IFU based observations of the dynamics of distant galaxies. Um, one has to be quite careful with those comparisons because the sort of degree of settledness of galaxies is uh, is a large function, it appears, of mass, but also um, the observations are extremely challenging. And so um, you have beam smearing and all sorts of observational effects that aren't trivial to get around. Um, but, you know, the dynamics of distant galaxies are very, very different than those in the, in the low redshift universe, as I think many people in this call are aware. Um, and there are really quite excellent observations of these now, and certainly with James Webb in the coming years, there will be even better observations of the dynamics of these systems. Um, and so that might be something that's worth really uh, thinking about carefully, whether the simulations are actually robust enough that you could compare them head to head against observations of, of distant galaxies and, and their uh, gas dynamics. Also ALMA, I mean, ALMA already has beautiful, um, uh, beautiful, uh, kinematic maps and so forth of, of galaxies in the distant universe, a different phase of gas. But um, but these are, are things that might be worth really thinking about in detail. Sanj. Hi, um, I wanted to just follow up on the the radio flow uh, observation that Dushan showed very nicely and uh, the wonderful project that Philippo is planning to do with uh, Dushan. Um, so some of the things galaxies uh, show radial flows. Um, and I was wondering, so first I have a comment. So that's something that uh, I was wondering if uh, a few galaxies probably show like 15 kilometers per second radial flow in 21 centimeters. So if that's something that is consistent with uh, what the simulations are showing. And the second thing is, um, this is something new. Uh, we are working on a galaxy, and it's kind of interesting because it's an extended UV disk, and we see that a uh, galaxy is suddenly forming stars in the outskirts. And we do see some little bit of radial flow, but we also see that right where the radial flow starts, there is also flaring. So my question is that uh, in, in the simulations that uh, your, you and your team are doing, do you see flaring of the disk? And if that is something uh, one can uh, measure to quantify uh, gas accretion onto the disk? Who would like to comment? I guess Dushan has, has a hand. Yeah, I, I mean, we have not looked at the flaring specifically. I think 15 kilometers per second for uh, five times that the nine solar masses of gas would give you a very high supply rates much higher than the inner star formation. So it, that might be more starbursty galaxy or it might be some specific region. So we see huge variations in these numbers. So this is average over time and over many radii in the disk. Uh, yeah, so I, I, it doesn't seem impossible, but that, that would give you much more than few solar masses a year. Uh, but for flaring, I, I, we haven't looked into this. It's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if anyone I'll look into this in simulations. I want to comment. Well, Filippo has a hand up. Yes, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I, I would be curious to see this observation that you, you were talking about. 
now I don't see you anymore in my screen. But um, um, uh, it is extremely difficult to see radial motions at the level of below five kilometers per second, above should be, because they are incredibly degenerate with the position angle that you choose and the presence of warps in the outer parts. You can, if you keep the position angle fixed, you, you, you think that there are no warps, it's full of radial flows. But then when you start uh, modeling the world, so many times galaxies are perfectly uh, explained by circular motion. So, so it, it, the, the, the way uh, I'm thinking of doing this together with uh, Enrico Di Teodoro, who wrote the, the software Barolo that I use, um, is, is to try to, 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 model the, to fit these things simultaneously. And I think, I, I think it's not been done. And, and it's uh, and, and potentially having the, the accretion the, the accretion profile, which would be the key, I think, because then you can compare to what uh, what Luzon uh, is predicting, and what uh, uh, vertical accretion is predicting, because also the accretion from the corona predicts radial flows. It's, uh, it's not, uh, as I tried to say it, it doesn't it doesn't go straight at, at the right velocity. There is, there is a radial flow in the disk that is still predicted. And, and so, I mean, maybe it can be done, but I'm not sure. Uh, I want to clarify that I am not observing 15 kilometer per second. I'm just quoting ah, okay. the result from things, which is, I think, 2403. It is. Oh, no, 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 no. 2403 is my galaxy. Yeah, no, no. so <laughs> that's why I, I, you know that much better. No, uh, but no, what I'm seeing is about seven-ish kilometers in NGC of uh, 3344. Ah, okay. 24 so, has, has 15 kilometers per second in the extraplanar gas. This is in fact something that I'm very interested about. So that if, you, if, you, if you select the extraplanar gas, then there is a very clear radial flow. If you, if you look at the disk only, then you are at zero. What does it mean? I don't know. I mean, I, I, my, I, I have my bias, but uh, I don't know, Yuzan, if you have your ideas about this. Okay. Uh, Nir has been patiently having a hand up. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I, I, so this was with regard to the previous uh, comment about magnetic fields and their possible effects. So sorry to kind of take us back a minute, but um, uh, one of the issues that uh, in context of how streams can transport angular momentum to the galaxy, so as uh, I discussed yesterday and as um, Dushan also mentioned today, streams can exchange a lot of material with the ambient halo through this kind of uh, m m mass entrainment through the turbulent mixing layers. And in principle, that could have reduced the angular momentum of cold streams as they entrain more material from the you know um, ambient hot halo, which may have had lower specific um, um, angular uh, um, uh, momentum. There were these new simulations called the Extreme Horizon simulations run with Ramses, who actually showed that as you enhance the resolution in the um, intergalactic and circ uh, circumgalactic medium, um, the angular momentum both of inflowing streams and of the resulting galaxies tended to be lower, and they hypothesized that this could be due and seemed consistent with the predictions for mass entrainment of streams as they flow in along the way. However, if you include magnetic fields, uh, and this is something that we're kind of only, you know, uh, starting to learn uh, right now. I, I didn't have really time to go into this yesterday, but you dramatically, almost entirely suppress the entrainment of uh, halo material onto the stream, even with an initial plasma beta of uh, a thousand or, or even uh, e e even more. Now, this is seems to be qualitatively different from the cloud crushing problem, where starting with an initial plasma beta of a hundred or a thousand, at the end of the day, your mass entrainment isn't that different than the case without magnetic fields. But for streams, it seems to be quite, quite different, and, and that might really affect the net angular momentum of inflowing gas onto the disk and the sizes of disks at the end. Mm -hmm. So the jury is still very much out on that. Uh, Freika, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I just want to mention, uh, so there's a paper which looks much more at disks than, than the one that I wrote, so uh, by Joe Whittingham, uh, Christoph Frommer is on it, and um, uh, Martin Sparr. Uh, so they look at this as a function of resolution, and, and I think that's agreeing with what Neil just said. That um, so they find that as um, they increase the resolution, the 
in the hydrodynamic simulations, the discs decrease, and in the magnetic in the MHD simulations, the the discs increase with uh, increasing resolution. So the their simulation at poor resolution were basically the same, and then they like diverge as they go to higher and higher resolution. So it's something that you would really only sort of start see in zooms because the resolution of um, sort of large volume simulations is uh, is sort of their the, the lowest resolution that they tried so Nicholas hi yes um, uh, I wanted to go back to the question of, of these co-rotation disks and my question is to Dushan in relation to what Filippo has said um, what is the thickness of these disks um, observationally there's a lot of evidence that these co-rotation disks are happening on scales of 10 to 50 kiloprosec. Um, Stephanie Hall, we've done this in 10 years ago, and that dates back to the 90s, actually, the first evidence for this. Um, and, and Filippo said that the disk is not having any radial inflow, but the thick disk is. So my question is, at 20, 40 kiloprosec, what is the thickness of this co-rotating structure in kiloprosec? So I guess that's uh, recognition. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, let me actually check the. I mean, based on these uh, figures here, the, with the particle tracking uh, that went to uh, from 20 to 70 kpc, I mean, randomly selected particles seem to be coming from plus and minus 20 kpc. About and below the disk, I can share the screen maybe. Uh, I don't know, should I share it for a second? Sorry. Briefly, yeah. Uh, Okay, I'll just share this thing. Yeah, so based based on, on this particular random sample, so we haven't measured it, but then you look here at like 65 kpc, they're coming from typically from uh, plus and minus 20, 25 kpcs. Um, similar in this case, but we would have to weight it with the mass distribution and uh, perhaps kinematics. So it seems relatively consistent with what you're saying, but we don't have the number. But at the edge of at the edge of the disk, it seems like a few kiloprocess, several kiloprocess. Yeah. yeah, very very close to the disk. Yes, that you would drop very close, but even then you're spread out. I would say uh, right. much more than where, few kpc. Whereas and, and, Filippo's disk is like 200 cross, like the thin H1 disk. Yes, and the, and the extra planar gas is a few kiloparsecs. Yeah, it's typically a few kiloparsecs for extra planar, but I wanted to now comment on something related. So some of these particles, as you can see, as they are approaching, they are kind of dropping at the disk at the very last moment. I mean, they uh, at the end, they will lose a little bit of angular momentum. So I don't know if th that could explain some of the uh, uh, large radial velocity changes in the extra planar gas. Uh, their, their kinematic will definitely be different than the stuff that's already in the disk. But uh, so Nikolai, I don't know if this answered your question, but this is just a rough estimate by eye from the plot. So we don't have the full numbers. Yeah, thanks a lot. From this, it lo looks like Filippo's um, observations and the co-rotation um, at large radii is compatible. So that's great. Thanks. Have a shy. Uh, Nicola, I assume you refer mostly to higher redshift, don't you? Uh, that's usually where you are measuring things. Anyway, yes, higher redshift is a little different. I don't think it's appropriate to call it an extended disk. It's really streams which are spiraling in and becoming co-rotating into a ring. And on large scale, it's just three or so streams coming in with angular momentum. And I want to to refer to what Fricky and uh, Neil said about magnetic fields. Neil said that it's a mechanism to reduce the loss of angular momentum of the incoming streams. But I want to say that another key factor is the clumpiness of the streams. Because if the streams become very clumpy, these are the satellites that flow with the streams into the galaxy through the halo, and they are a mechanism for losing angular momentum by dynamical friction. So if we are able to resolve the streams, which we are not in simulations, but if we are able to resolve the streams properly in cosmological simulations, 
we will start seeing more and more the Hanukkah fiction and more and more loss of Angela Momentum. And my question to Neil and Frick is, what do Angela do magnetic fields tell us about this? Are they going to suppress the clumpiness or push the clumpiness? I'll have Frick go first as a panelist, and then you're. I have no idea because <laughs> I've only looked at this at, um, at low redshift. I did, so, okay, so these simulations are Milky Ways at low redshift, so at high redshift, they're puny, right? They're, they're super small. And I did look at I did look at them, and there's very little difference that I saw. But but they are they are dwarfs. I'm not sure, you know, like they're not really the stream fed things that, that you're talking about. Um, so I don't know. Maybe near is a better place to answer this. Near. Um, well, I, I mean, the short answer is I can't yet say for certain. Uh, I can say that uh, we do expect streams to be clumpy because they are prone to gravitational instabilities. We know from uh, filamentary networks in the um, interstellar medium in GMCs that magnetic fields can suppress gravitational fragmentation, but probably not at the qualitative level. Uh, maybe they, they might slightly reduce the clumpiness, but uh, I mean, it remains to be seen what happens in the parameter regime that these cold streams are in, uh, how much magnetic fields would or wouldn't reduce the clumpiness, but I, I would expect them to reduce it somewhat. Thank you. Dushan. I just want to say I, I agree with Davish I that uh, any like self gravitation within the stream that's that's an issue and resolving that it's hard. But in terms of resolving uh, substructure that can hold gas, I think we are okay there because uh, after reionization you won't host much baryons unless you are uh, more than a few times ten to eight or ten to nine solar masses per halo. So you can resolve it, but the instabilities that are either cell gravitation or hydro within the stream, that, that's still an issue. So I agree with that. Abhishek. Projecting on next week topic, uh, this clumpiness of the streams is a key to evaluating how they are going to affect the disk that they are forming. Because streams bring in angular momentum, this we discussed, and of course gas for star formation, but they also can generate turbulence in the disk, which is going to affect the whole evolution of the disk at high redshift. And a key to the ability of the streams to affect the disk is their clumpiness. Because if they are smooth streams, they're not going to do much in terms of steering turbulence. It's really like a low density stream hitting a high density disk. But if they are clumpy and made of dense clumps, they are going to steer and maybe even dominate the steering of turbulence and this can then affect all its evolution, the transport in and so on. That's why the clumpiness is such a key feature of the streams together with the angular momentum, which and they talk to each other. Yeah, and I, I, the current conversation just inspired a contribution by Dylan Nelson to the visualization channel where he's posted some pictures of clumpy streams. Um, I guess uh, I, I, I personally, want to hear this panel's response to a question I directed at the Tuesday panel, <laughs> which is uh, from a galaxy evolution perspective, including the topics we're going to discuss next week, uh, it's important to be able to distinguish between how much of the gas entering of the galaxy is recirculating and how much is fresh accretion. Uh, and so uh, I guess I, I'd like the panelists to address uh, how are observers to go about distinguishing these things? Can I, I, can, I, can I just start speaking? So I think I think just look at high redshift. That's my recommendation. If you want to see fresh accretion that isn't been that hasn't been recycled, go to as high redshift as possible because I think at low redshift it's all recycling. Like I mean like 90 plus percent. Right. So in a way, um, I, I want to focus the question that there's what we think is happening from simulations, right? And my question is, how are we going to go about distinguishing them observationally so we know that the simulations are right or wrong? <laughs> what, what do people need to look at? What, what are the distinguishing features? Well, I have one partial answer is, if you consider the, the star formation rate, even at 32, uh, 
uh, what you observe typically is higher than what what you get without recycling. And you really need to use the gas again and again in order to reach star formation rates that are observable. And that's effective too. So I think the number that Dushan quoted, she quoted some uh, paper in his own work, were about the recycling is three times more than, or two times or three times more than the fresh equation. I think it should be two also for attentive too, just to overcome this problem that you can't recover the, the high specific star formation rate without it. Okay. Other panelists? I, I don't know. It's, I mean, some of the, um, the feedback will also help stop some of, like, you, feedback isn't all objective, right? You don't all, you don't it accrete like you would in a no feedback simulation and then, like, remove it, remove it. And that's how you stop the star formation rate from being too ridiculously high. Like, it's, there's also some, the fact that you have outflows that stop some of the inflows from coming in. Uh, so I think, um, well, I think, like going to, uh, well, I, okay, I still don't think I'm really answering the question, but I think like the low met, high redshift, low metallicity, cool gas is the most likely to be inflowing. Um, but that said, like, how can you rule out any of our models? I think it's really difficult because I think um, the last word has not been said yet about how, how much the gas mixes. So I, I wouldn't be able to confidently give you like this metallicity threshold that I think would be reasonable, but um, that yeah. may be the way to go. So I'm going to ask Gwen to weigh in here. She's the, the observer outnumbered by theorists on this panel. But um, what's your wish list then <laughs> as someone who's trying to observe these phenomena? Gwen. What's my wish list for observations or for the theorists uh, to make predictions well, about? Uh, you, uh, you can comment on both, really. <laughs> Sure. So the challenge at high redshift is if you're interested in getting within the virial radius of a galaxy, there's an enormous contrast problem with quasars. And so building a very large sample is extremely challenging. Um, I'm actually working on trying to build an instrument and fundraise for an instrument to get a larger sample. So we'll see. If anyone wants to give me $20 million, please let me know. I'm taking any donations. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the challenge. It's like if you want to do these kinds of things, you have to think pretty big. Um, so, so that's, I think, one thing that would be great. Um, but uh, I think, you know, already with the sample that we do have, which is very modest within the real radius at high redshift, you know, we have made a number of measurements of things like the temperature of the gas and so forth, which are, are in some ways less model dependent than, um, than uh, you know, uh, things like metallicity, where you have to go through photoionization modeling and all of these sorts of um, practices. I think, you know, that would be an interesting thing um, to see uh, predicted out of simulations. Now, the, the first round of comparisons I've done against uh, predictions that have been made um, suggests that they may be broadly consistent. But I think one challenge is that um, producing a mass weighted temperature distribution in the distant universe is extremely hard and very, very, very model dependent. And so we need to do far more careful comparisons, I think, with, with the simulations than what's possible uh, without sort of direct interaction, I think. But so that's one of my wish lists is to look at things like that. You know, um, I think the kinematics are very interesting as well. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's, of course, new novel observations um, coming out of Muse and KCWI that I think will also be interesting in the distant universe. But, um, but you know, I think, I think one of the things that's missing is some really careful discussions between observers and theorists to really get at what it is that's robust from these simulations that should be predicted um, for the observations and then doing a really, really careful comparison. So, you know, I've seen 10 papers that claim to reproduce our statistics for H1 covering fraction around Lyman break galaxy that redshift two. And in detail, if you actually look at them, they don't actually reproduce the statistics because they reproduce, you know, the covering fraction of Lyman limit systems, which is a very, uh, very tiny little itty bit of the, the distribution of H1 that we're looking at in these systems. Um, and you might reproduce that and get literally everything else wrong, or you might get everything else right, but unless you've checked, you don't know. And so I think this is the problem. It's like, we need to, 
and this isn't this isn't a, a criticism. I think it's a, an opportunity. We need to work harder at these comparisons and look at more details. There are observations of more detailed uh, distributions, um, both at high redshift and at low redshift. Um, you know, we have new results coming out of Cubs on um, you know the the galactic environment of line and limit systems at you know intermediate redshift during the turn down of star formation. We will have new metallicity measurements coming out of these from Friday Hetty. So like the, these there are. And you know there are abundance measurements at, at low redshift as well. Um, you know it's not. Uh, I think it. We just need to do a little bit more careful job of the comparisons. And I think one of the things that's really missing from this is having some really direct conversations between theorists and observers, and asking the theorists to really say, okay, well, what what of this do you think is truly robust in your simulations? And ask the observers, what do you think is truly robust out of these measurements that you've made? And see if you can't meet in that middle ground. Um, where you have really expertise on both sides in the discussion. Okay, well, a number so of hands went up. Yeah, yeah, a number of hands went up. And, and in fact, this workshop seems like exactly the kind of place where those conversations should get started. <laughs> um, maybe we can ha take a, a stab at that next week. And if you're willing to help organize that, I'll let you use my credit card for those $20 million. How about that? Okay. I hope you have a very high limit, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so in, in, uh, uh, Filippo's a panelist, so we'll go with him first, and then Nick, and then Crystal. Thanks. First, uh, I've, I've started my career as a pure uh, observer, and then I started to do theory and more theory, and my, my goal was always to be considered a theoretician. And Mark, thank you very much. Today, you, you put me completely uh, with the theoreticians. Thank you. I have achieved my goal. You're very welcome. <laughs> now, now, now I can say something from the observational point of view. And uh, um, I, 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 I think, I mean, if we are thinking that we are going to see zero metallicity gas that is falling into the Milky Way, I mean, this is not going to happen, right? So, so most of the times uh, in, in Milky Way or local universe study, you are happy with point one, with the... Uh, Point zero or something that uh, that you would call it recycled to some extent, but uh, but the, 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 there is an enormous fraction of uh, let's say sort of pristine gas in that uh, in, in that material, and maybe it has been uh, uh, polluted, but maybe at redshift four, God God knows when. So so um, I don't know. I, I was I was saying, I, was, I wanted to make this comment that. Uh, uh, to, uh, in response to uh, uh, Freke's point that we have to go at high acid, but in low acid, low metallicity material is uh, it, it, it's never going to be pristine, but still is very different from the material that is in the disk. Okay, uh, Nick, Nicholas. Yeah, uh, my comment was similar to uh, Filippo's here, is that the definition of uh, the distinction you're trying to make is a little bit difficult because recycled accretion is difficult to really distinguish between uh, something that's being mixed by outflows and coming from outside or is actually something from inside the disk and then just being like a fountain scenario. And um, as Avishai pointed out, the accretion rate is um, higher, higher redshift, so accretions rate are higher. But at low redshift in the simulations, maybe Dushan can say, uh, is there a regime of mass or, um, or redshift where the, there's nothing coming from cosmological accretion, whether it's enriched or not, but there's nothing coming the, at the real radius and all of the accretion is therefore being recycled uh, like a fountain. Okay. Is, that, is that a question? Yeah, what redshift and what mass? Um, that occurs one day is only okay, a function. We'll have Dushan address that and then get to Crystal's point. I mean, the problem with these zoom in simulations are low number statistics, but even in those examples that I showed from uh, Daniel Langlas Alcazar, there was definitely a non negligible percentage of material that wasn't, as he called it, processed in other galaxies. It doesn't mean that this was the prim uh, primordial metallicity. It can still get polluted through mixing, through the previous outflows and so on. But uh, in the plots I showed, there were like 10, 20 percent of material, even at late times, that was not been recycling and not intergalactic transfer. 
And this was true at 10 to the 11 and also 10 to the 12 solar mass halos. So it wasn't 100% even close to the galaxy, but the, this might be the material that maybe get some uh, small metallicity from mixing with uh, stuff that was actually kicked out and coming back. Yeah, so we, I would say those are, <laughs> statistics are poor. We have few individual objects at each mass, but there's definitely an example of stuff that uh, was not directly polluted, but still might be indirectly polluted through mixing. Uh, Crystal. Um, there's, limited but some measurements and constraints on inflow speeds at, at low redshift and I'll review what's out there next week. Um, th this is really a comment and a plea for more discussion kind of like Wynn was saying between observers and theorists about what could be learned from the inflow speeds but at z of zero as well as at, at high z. I mean it seems like in the, in the two regimes right you, you've made it clear we're talking about different physical processes probably, where at low Z, we're looking at inflow either from a fountain or from the cooling flows that John told us about um, yesterday or, or some complicated combination of, of the two. And, you know, if, if observers were to be motivated and, and fueled kind of to go out there and get a lot more of these inflow measurements, we need to understand more clearly whether it can you know, not so much prove one model over another, but rule something out, right? I mean, this is complicated and it's hard to argue that, that, that you can prove any one thing, but if you can exclude a model or a class of models, you know, that, that might be the more useful kind of direction for assembling a larger observational program. So this is just kind of a, a challenge to the theorists to think about that and maybe have more discussion next week. Okay. Um, there's a question in the Slack from Kong Yao Zhang. When we talk about differences between high and low redshift objects, do we mean the differences between low and high mass galaxies? Is there a big difference between galaxies at low and high redshift, but with similar peak height? Abishai. Yes, I think there's a difference, a uh, big difference. One is the accretion rate is much higher at high redshift, and B, the gas fraction is much higher. And those two make this difference independent of whether you're talking about the high peaks, high sigma peaks or low sigma peaks. But the narrowness of the streams does depend on the peak height. So it's a combination. Okay. Um, I see a, a question from uh, Salgat Mujahid. Um, what is the maximum radial velocity an inflowing gas stream can achieve for a Milky Way type galaxy at low Z? at around 20 kiloparsecs. It's typically the real velocity. Whatever you do, it's around the real velocity, whatever it is. 200 okay. and some. Ah, yes, I, I see. I, I, now I see you've answered that question in the thread <laughs> while we were offline. Um, earlier in the discussion online, uh, Marcus Bruggen asked the question, uh, can the fire simulations of the cosmic rays explain that for lower mass galaxies, uh, cosmic rays escape the gas fast, galaxy fast, thus removing energy from the galaxy instead of it being rated as synchrotron radiation? So this is regarding the um, fire simulations of the cosmic rays. Um, I mean, I can briefly comment. So in the dwarf galaxies, the, the cosmic rays are not dominating pressure in the halo. Uh, so I would say they probably play secondary role. It's much easier to escape those. They don't have much uh, higher gas densities, but they, they play only secondary role. Okay. Uh, Filippo. Yes, I had a question about this actually for Dozen. So the, the simulation with cosmic rays that you showed, um, the, the, uh, you said that the hot gas sort of disappeared and the, the whole uh, uh, environment becomes warm, right? Uh, yeah, so the yeah. gravitationally heated hot gas, it's very rare. There is a little bit, but it's much, much smaller fraction. And if you see hot gas, it's usually super bubbles at the disk. But when you so go can, to like can, any KPC from the disk, the fraction of hot gas is extremely low. Can't you then, then constrain the amount of cosmic ray energy uh, that, that realistically can be uh, 
injected, given that we are seeing hot gas surrounding Milky Way type of galaxies. So we know more or less uh, uh, what is the distribution and what is the mass of this hot gas. And so it, to some extent, right, you, this could be a way to, to, to constrain the, the cosmic ray injection. Yeah, so th I mean, that's definitely, well, I don't know if injection, but the transport in the CGM can probably be constrained like that. And we are trying, so TKHM has a paper on this scale interface where he's trying to calculate X-ray emission from that region. And uh, the, the one you get from um, cosmic ray runs is definitely much lower than you get without cosmic ray runs. But star formation rate is also lower and they're kind of at the very low limit of observations. Uh, and these are difficult for spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. We rarely have direct information beyond like 10-ish KPCs. Everything else is like model extrapolation. Uh, but we will we will make more detailed predictions, and I, I don't think this is like the, the final word on cosmic rays. This is a simple model with a constant diffusion coefficient, and there are more I, I, physics. I have a quick clarifying question. When you're deciding how cosmic rays get put in, uh, is it just a, a parameter as as the fraction of of supernova energy? Yeah, which so is this is sort of parameter. Yeah, so this whole simulation is, yeah, yeah. Okay, that, but uh, I I think uh, just like just one sentence that uh, the input is important, but the transport in the CGM is even more important. Okay. So if you leave the galaxy with certain diffusion, effective diffusion coefficient, and then you speed up and leave the halo faster, then you might have this mixed scenario where you probably will have much more hot gas than we see right now in these okay. simulations, and the effect might be stronger in the inner halo, but very weak in the outer halo. So there's, I think there's a wide range of possibilities that we have not explored in detail. In fact, one of my, you know, the takeaways I took from week three was uh, different implementations of cosmic ray transport have quite different qual results, qualitative results in the CGM. And there's still a lot of uncertainties in the plasma physics um, as to whether they stream or not. <laughs> and this does have big consequences. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I would not invest $20 million into one particular cosmic ray diffusion. I would maybe use Mark's credit card, but not my own. <laughs> it's already maxed out after Glenn uses it, I'm afraid. Um, Freka. Yeah, I just wanted to like, ask or raise a point that maybe if, um, you know, maybe observations of the hot gas at low redshift, like would, and then going to lower mass, as low mass as possible would help rule out certain models. And then for us simulators, like for us, it's always easier to do the small stuff, right? And for observations, it's always easier to see the big stuff. So it's sort of the opposite problem, right? Then for us to, like, I mean, I also am, um, uh, guilty. I also like simulate Milky Ways, but maybe we should all be pushing towards trying to make realistic early types and and groups and like yeah you know, large scale things, and then we can sort of I don't know focus on uh, on on rolling out models that way. Also with future X ray uh, missions. But, yeah. Uh, so so about before someone else answering, I'll say the other thing about simulations is you get you, you see the invisible stuff much better than the observers do. <laughs> and this comes up big when you're talking about um, things that could potentially be seen in X-ray absorption in the future. Um, but yes, you're good at seeing invisible stuff. Uh, anyway, who cares to comment? I, the I was thinking of X-ray emission, by the way. Right. I think, well, in, in, in comment on that, I, uh, in the near future, uh, we're more likely to have good X-ray, uh, well, we'll have X-ray absorption constraints <laughs> uh, from uh, upcoming spectroscopy emissions. Um, and I guess we'll have, we'll end, end up getting X-ray emission constraints from stacking of Rosita stuff in the, in the not too distant future. So I, I see Cameron has a hand up. Well, I, I, I definitely agree with Freka's comment that it would be useful to be looking at other types of galaxies. Much of the focus of simulations is to focus on star-forming systems, um, Milky Way analogs, and that sort of thing. But uh, one major challenge to that is 
when you start dealing with early type systems, then you have AGN feedback and, and AGN feedback is potentially much more uncertain in terms of how we parameterize that in the simulation. So it is, it is definitely a hurdle, but I, I agree that, that we could probably learn a lot more about these systems by diversifying the simulation targets that we're, that we're choosing to, to model. Ben's hand keeps flickering on and off. I'm going to call on him. Okay. Well, I have a few. Um, uh, what makes you think X-ray absorption will be uh, sooner than X-ray? Or so? Wh why are you so high on that? Um, well, uh, I, I, I anticipate some X-ray absorption to do by chrism, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully there'll be something like Arcus in the not too distant future. Yeah, let's make that happen. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, let's talk on, offline on that because I'm talking to uh, Randall Smith about that next week. So, oh, is, very good. It would be nice yeah. if he could drop in on week eight. He's going to try. He's going to try. Um, yeah, I don't think that Prism is going to do much. His resolution is really poor and it doesn't have much collecting area. Okay, so but, it just does the area to make progress over what's already being done. But August and uh, Athena. Focus could go up in the late latter part of this decade, probably before Athena. And it would uh, essentially do what you could do in UV astronomy, but X ray wavelengths. Yeah. I will make the case in week eight the prism can do a few things to make progress, but it will certainly not survey lower mass halos the way that Arcus would. Okay. All right. Uh, we've reached one o'clock. Uh, and, uh, oh, Ben has something to say. After party, announce the after party. The oh, announce the after party. In one hour, if you have not had enough science, there is an SZ CGM after party. Um, so quick, get your lunch, fortify yourself for more science at the after party. I want to thank our panelists for a very insightful, lively discussion. I really learned a lot from it. Um, and so, uh, so I'm going to get a lunch and maybe coffee and and I'm going to come back for more science. I don't know about you, but, but I'm loving it. So uh, if you're not coming back for an after party, we will see you uh, maybe some of you on tomorrow uh, where we have our structured discussion sections. And if not that um, on Monday, when we start tackling how gaseous halos affect galaxy evolution. <laughs>